right, we're joined now by a man who blasted four home runs in the 1980 World Series for the Kansas City Royals, becoming the first player in the history of the Fall Classic to hit two home runs in a game twice in the same series. Former Royal skipper Jim Fry once said he would be the next Willie McCovey, but soon life away from baseball began to consume, which led to Cohen Cain addiction and a lengthy stint in prison. It was while incarcerated, though, that Willie Mays Akins turned his life around. A compelling story which Akins teamed with Gregory Jordan to pen titled Willie Mays Akins, Safe at Home. We're joined now by Mr. Akins. Willie, how are you today? I'm doing wonderful. How about you? Good, good. So let's start with your book. Uh, it's certainly a story which is hard to put down, but how did that process begin? Were you approached about doing a book, or did you seek out someone? Who wanted to share your story? Well, uh, I had, had thought about doing a book when I was in prison, and almost every day when I was incarcerated, people used to talk to me about Willie. Are you going to write a book or what about your life? So, while I was incarcerated, uh, Gregory Jordan he did a book with my agent Ron Shapiro, mm -hmm. and one day they were having lunch, and Ron asked Greg what his next project was going to be, mm -hmm. and Greg started talking about how he had heard about me going to prison and how I was his childhood idol and everything growing up as a kid. Mm -hmm. And Greg, Greg didn't know that Ron was my ex baseball agent. Mm. And Ron just, Ron just came out and told him that, hey, if you want to get in contact with Willie, I got his contact information and everything. And Ron gave Greg my contact information. Greg contacted me while I was in culture. And just started collaborating on, about a book, man. So can you share your mindset during your playing days to now? You once said if you keep hitting, you keep getting away with it. How has that perspective changed after all these years and all you've been through? Well, I, my, the biggest change is my spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've always said that if I would have had a spiritual life when I was a baseball player, uh, the choices that I made would have, have been better. Uh, when I was a ball player, you know, it was it was all, all about me. Uh, I was selfish. Uh, I had the skill, you know, to make it to the, the major leagues. But after I got to the big leagues, uh, I guess my character faults that I had inside of me wasn't good enough to, to keep me in the big leagues as a uh, as a ball player. Uh, I made some some ba bad choices, you know, and everybody makes bad choices in life. Right. But my mindset today, you know, is that. You know, it's not uh, all about me. I've become a, a servant, and mm -hmm. I try to help other people now. Mm -hmm. And as a ball player, you know, I, I didn't have that mindset. I I wanted to get everything for Willie Akins. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a servant. Mm -hmm. Everything was was for me. Uh, I had pride, I had ego, which got in the way. And today, you know, I've, I've become humble. Mm -hmm. And because of my spiritual life, I'm, I'm able to make better choices. And I believe that the little voice inside of me, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. that's inside of me that allows me each day to, to be convicted when I even think about making bad choices in mm -hmm. my life. So the, the, the biggest change for me is my spiritual life. Mm -hmm. You know, one story that uh, struck me in your book was an exchange you had with Hall of Famer Frank Robinson where you were calling him Mr. Robinson. Can you share that story with our listeners? I think that, I always thought that was very interesting. Well, you know, uh, I used to watch Frank uh, growing up as a kid. Mm -hmm. And even before even before I signed to be a professional baseball player, I met Frank. I was playing up in Baltimore for an amateur team named A. Mm -hmm. And the scout, Walter Yowes, who eventually signed me, he was the general manager for uh, for Giants, but he was also a scout for the, the Baltimore Orioles. Mm -hmm. And he he used to take me over to the Memorial Stadium, and I used to catch batting practice for the, the Baltimore Orioles. And after I would catch batting practice, they would let me uh, get in the, the batter's box and uh, and hit. But in 1974, even before I became a professional baseball player, I got to meet Jim Fry, who eventually was my manager in 1980. Mm -hmm. I got a chance to meet uh, Frank Robinson, uh, Brooke Robinson, Boop Powell, and all those uh, eight people back then, even before I became a professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. But at the time when I talked with Frank, I was struggling, and I was kind of lost. And he was the hitting instructor for the, the Baltimore Orioles at the time. Mm -hmm. And I really went over to, to seek his advice about what I should do as a hitter. And he wasn't really able to give me a whole lot of advice because he was on the opposing team at the time. Right. 
But we did talk, and by him just telling me a few things, I can't exactly remember what the conversation was, but, you know, I respected uh, Frank Robinson as a major league baseball player and as a person when he became the first black manager in baseball and all that, but Mm -hmm. I was just thrilled to death to just to even go over there and have a a conversation with him Mm -hmm. and get his (laughs) advice about stuff. So you had teammates who had particular impact on your career and your life. What if Hal McCray and George Brett meant to you? Well, when I came to the Royals, you know, George and me was, uh, was about the same age. But uh, Hal, he's uh, a few years, he's about five or six years uh, older than me. But during my drinking and drugging days in Kansas City, Hal McCray was was one of the guys on the team that, you know, I went to for advice and I talked to him. And I didn't pay any attention to what he told me. You know, he told me I should stop doing what I was doing before it was too late, and I, I got caught. Mm-hmm. And I, would, I wish I had to taken his uh, advice, but I didn't. And Hal was the only player that, when I was incarcerated, you know, I, I wrote to some of my teammates, especially when I, I filed for, for clemency, commutation of my sentence with the president. Mm-hmm. I, just wanted, I, just, I just wanted to get a, a letters from those guys to support me and ask for a sentence reduction. Mm-hmm. And I only heard from Hal McCray. I didn't. I didn't hold that against those guys or anything. Mm-hmm. And George was the person that I got in contact with when I got out of prison. Mm-hmm. And George basically was the person that helped me get a, a job with the the Kansas City Royals. And I hadn't been in contact with George for for twenty something years. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was just like, hey, we was we were still a, a teammate. So George, George, and uh, Hal McCray. Especially Hal, when I got out of prison in 2008, I got in contact with Hal, and Hal had already lined up a construction job for me. So so my first job that I had when I got out of prison was through my old teammate, Hal McCray. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing now with the Royals and speaking engagements? Are you still in, in, you know, involved in that? Well, I'm a coach mm-hmm. and a mentor with the Kansas City Royals uh, organization. I'm a student instructor in whatever the Kansas City Royals asked me to do. Uh, during the off season, my time right now from September to uh, the end of February, you know, I'm I'm doing speaking engagements. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm signing and selling my book. I have a four-year-old daughter, uh, Sarah. I'm raising her, and I'm taking care of, uh, of a wife that's handicapped. But my, my main job with the Kansas City Royals is a hitting instructor coach. Uh, mentor to the, the young players, the speaking engagements and the, the book signing and, and selling and stuff uh, like that is something that I'm I do on the side. Mm-hmm. So you went from the slugging first base and from the 1980 pennant winner to spending the final 12 games of your big league career with Toronto at the age of 30 in 1985. Did you then, or do you even look back now and think that if things had gone differently, you would have been a part of that title team? Well, there's no doubt in my mind that I would have still been here in Kansas City. If you look at the year when I got traded in 1983, that was my best year in the big leagues. I hit over 300, had 20-something home runs, mm-hmm. and drove in over 80-something runs, I think. Mm-hmm. But I was also one of the first active major league baseball players to go to prison in 1983, along with three of my teammates. And I didn't have a, a great relationship with the manager of the Kansas City Royals, Dick Hauser. When Dick became the manager, he started platooning me. Mm-hmm. And because I was using drugs at the time, I had a bad attitude against that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started coming to the ballpark late, or I wouldn't take batting practice or infield. And after I had that bad year in Toronto, you know, it got around the league that I was a troublemaker, mainly because of the relationship that I, that I had with Dick Hobbs and the Kansas City Royals in 1983. Mm-hmm. So here I am, a troublemaker and a, a criminal record. So after I had a bad year in the big league, nobody wanted to take a, a chance on me. Mm-hmm. But there's no doubt in my mind, if those things hadn't happened, if I wasn't the, the first active ball player to go to prison, if I hadn't been on drugs, there's no doubt in my mind that I would have been a part of of that 1985 team that won the World Series. Now, to say things that would have gone the, the same way, mm-hmm. I don't know. Right. 
So what was it like for you watching your former club not only make the playoffs for the first time in 29 years this past October, but march all the way to Game 7 of the World Series? Well, what it did is it, it not only got the Kansas City Royals back in the spotlight, but it got me back in the spotlight. Maybe mm. because what I did in the 1980 World Series. Mm. But I guess the, the most thrilling part for me was seeing some of those guys that I coached in the, the minor leagues, uh, Terrence Gore, uh, having an a impact. Salvi Perez told me, uh, you know, during the playoffs, where I was at, why I didn't come in and, and celebrate with the team that, you know, I was a part of the team. So mm-hmm. I just, uh, just from having a, a relationship and being a part of the Kansas City Royals and seeing those young kids have su- success and especially seeing what Dayton Moore has done for the Kansas City Royals organization. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been, uh, he's been working with his team for the past seven years and I was just thrilled to death to, just to see what Dayton and his staff have put together finally rise to the top. And to be a coach in the system, maybe even more, it's been thrilling, thrilling for me. So what do they mean for the community and Royals fans? I mean, you living in the Kansas City area, I mean, they'd waited so long for the team's resurrection. What was that like being in the Kansas City community during that run? Well, what it did, you know, baseball in Kansas City for the last 29 years hasn't been that great. Right. I mean, we still average the 20-some thousand uh, fans a game, even losing all those years. But from my experience in Kansas City, Kansas City is a baseball town. And what the Royals did and is still doing is bringing some of those fans that left the team years ago back to the Kansas City uh, Royal team as fans. Mm-hmm. You know, d- doing my speaking engagements and my book signs and stuff like that, I run into old fans that told me that, you know, from what the Royals have done last year, 2014, that they have interest in going back to the games this year, 2015. So mm-hmm. I expect uh, the season ticket holders to be more. I expect uh, more fans this year uh, for the Kansas City Royals. But the Kansas City Royals 2014 team put the, the put Kansas City basically back on the on the map as a baseball team. Mm-hmm. And 80 percent of the country, from what I heard, was pulling for the Kansas City Royals in the World Series. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's probably accurate. It's probably undershooting it a little bit, probably. So, uh, you know, you talked about your speaking games and whatnot. Uh, ultimately, what is your message to young people, anyone struggling with addiction, be it cocaine, alcohol, gambling, what have you? What advice and guidance would you offer people struggling with that? Well, first of all, I just uh, ask people to, to read my books or uh, safe at home. The book was written because I was gone for a long period of time. But I believe, and from the feedback that I've gotten, it's an uh, inspirational book uh, for drug addicts and alcoholics, for people that uh, have been incarcerated for a long period of time. Uh, you know, I've gone back to prison and I've spoke. Um, my, mess, my message is basically that, hey, drugs and alcohol, the consequences are always the same if you become addicted to it and if you uh, abuse it. Mm-hmm. You either end up in jail you either end up in an institution or you end up dead. And we have so many examples of those consequences in our world today, and it seems like it, they just keep happening and happening mm-hmm. and happen. But not only that, for, you know, people, families that have ones that are incarcerated that, hey, you can go to prison and you can make something good to come out of a, a bad situation. Mm-hmm. When, the, when the public as a whole look at a person that's incarcerated, you know, they look at that person as somebody as, as a criminal, you know, no good, don't have a life. Right. But I've been able to come back to the streets and I've been able to to do okay so far. So my message to them is that, hey, you can make something good come out of a, a bad a situation. And it, it's a thrill for me to be able to, you know, send books to people that are incarcerated, be back and go back to the prisons and share what happened to me while I was incarcerated with the ones that are incarcerated and give them hope. So, so it's, um, it's a message about hope, inspiration, aspiration, or, and plus getting a, a spiritual life. To show people, you know, with a spiritual life that, that anything is possible with God. Mm-hmm. So how can people get a, you know, their hands on a copy of your book? 
I have a website, uh, willieakins24.com, and people can go on my website and, and order my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only my book, but other uh, baseball cards, baseballs, or hoodies and stuff like that. Uh, people can contact me on Facebook and Twitter and can contact me uh, there and can order my book. My email address is akinwilly24 at yahoo.com. Well, hey, Willie, it's really been a thrill talking to you. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time, so I appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk with us. Okay, brother. No problem. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care.